Hello, everybody. I'm Natalie Brunel. Thank you so much for checking out my show where I get to hear from the leading voices in Bitcoin, financial markets, political structures, philosophy, and more. Please make sure you're subscribed to the show. And if you're watching this on YouTube, like this video so more people see it and hit that notifications button so you don't miss out on any new content. This podcast does not provide financial advice. It is for educational and entertainment purposes only. So make sure you always do your own research before making any financial decisions and be aware of your risk tolerance. I'm able to produce this show thanks to my sponsors, and I'm very picky about who I choose to partner with. So I hope you'll take the time to listen to the ad reads throughout the show. I'm also able to produce this show thanks to the support of my listeners and viewers, Value for Value. So if you'd like to make a donation to help the show grow, you can find my Bitcoin and Lightning wallets in the description. All right, now to my main partner, Swan Bitcoin. Swan is where I do all of my Bitcoin purchases. In fact, I dollar cost average every single day, not every week, not by monthly, every single day. And they have the lowest fees in the space. I love Swan Bitcoin because it is a true Bitcoin only company. Swan has a ton of free educational resources on their website, and they now have a mobile app, which I've been using to smash by some Bitcoin. And Swan Studios produces my new show, Hard Money, which covers the biggest news in Bitcoin and the global economy. It's like an orange-pilled version of CNBC, so make sure to check that out on YouTube for all the biggest headlines, because we are not afraid to question the mainstream narrative. All right, it's time for the show. Eric, I'm so excited. This has been long overdue. Thanks so much for coming on my show. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Well, I want to hear a little bit more about you because I feel like you've had a really interesting background and you have a lot of experience with bond trading and venture capital and entrepreneurship. So let's start at the very beginning. You were okay. born in New York, right? Wow. That is the beginning. Yeah. That's the beginning. Okay. So <laughs> so tell us a little bit about that. Where are you from? What was your childhood like? I had a very idyllic childhood. Um, I was born in New York City, grew up uh, about half an hour, 45 minutes outside New York City, New Jersey. Um, two terrific parents. Dad is an entrepreneur, now retired, teaches entrepreneurship at Columbia Business School. And mom's like the best mom ever. Uh, super awesome mother, housewife, um, kind of made it all work. And um, have one sister. And, you know, just very fortunate. My family valued education. They were super supportive. And my sister and I were kind of, you know, given the emotional and financial support to kind of, uh, you know, pursue what we wanted to pursue and what we were interested in. So I was fortunate enough to graduate from uh, undergraduate and Columbia Business School as well with no student debt, which was super sweet of them and uh, was able to have kind of a, a clean, very advantaged start, I guess. So when you were young, what was your relationship to money? Did you, you, you obviously felt comfortable. You didn't want for anything. Did you think, you know, someday I want to be rich. I want to, you know, work in finance or in the world of investing. Yeah. Um, so no, it's a little different than that. Maybe even to some degree, the opposites as an entrepreneur, my father, um, you know, between debt and other obligations was personally on the line for his business. Um, my grandfather invented uh, the clothes carousel that you see in a dry cleaners. If you've ever seen that thing that brings the clothes around. Really? The dry cleaners. Yeah. And Whoa. then um, they patented that. Uh, they didn't really have the money to defend the patent. And then my father was the first person to come into the business, uh, you know, with kind of a formal education. And he was able to build that business into a business that kind of, um, in addition to the dry cleaner piece of it, they automated warehouses and brought in computers, uh, you know, back when that first came in and they enabled kind of robot picking from storage rooms and automating that whole process. So it was kind of an automated storage and retrieval system um, that kind of changed uh, manufacturing and warehouse uh, stockroom type stuff. Um, and then, so, you know, dad worked uh, seven days a week and, you know, he would like take me to school in the morning and, you know, would try to make it home by dinner every night. So you got a really good idea of work ethic, uh, also some stress in there, you know, there's good times and bad times. Um, I didn't want to go into a manufacturing business. I worked there every summer of my life growing up in like the back of the factory, 
you know, doing very manual labor until I could do, you know, kind of more intellectual stuff. Then I shadowed the head of sales and various other things. Um, but it's not an industry I wanted to go into. I was more interested in Wall Street and finance. And so my family sold the business in the mid 90s. Um, and yeah, I went to Wall Street. I started out um, as a bond trader was kind of my first job in the World Trade Center for a firm called Dean Witter, which then became Morgan Stanley Dean Witter, and did that for a few years. Then I went to Columbia Business School because there were no transferable skills from trading and I needed like a pivot point, like being a bond trader doesn't set you up to do anything else in life except be a bond trader. So um, I went to business school just to kind of, you know, as a way to pivot to something different. And that's when I got into venture capital and private equity. And I spent the next 10 years, nine years, I guess, investing in uh, internet related businesses, right as the internet bubble was approaching. Okay, wow. I want to hear about that. But going back <laughs> to your experience in bonds, what did you learn from that time about that industry and how bonds essentially make the world go round. Uh, what, what did what did you learn back yeah. then that can still be applied to our current you know financial world and markets? Wow, quite a lot. I mean, U.S. Treasury bonds, which are what I traded. I traded the shorter end of the curve, and I also traded the agency bonds, which in some ways is more interesting, like Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Federal Farm Credit Bank, um, these quasi-governmental AAA agencies. Um, it's really, you know, very macroeconomic driven. It's the same way that everybody now is very focused on paying attention to all these unemployment releases and things like that, you know before everybody was required to be kind of a uh, global macro economist just to survive, it was just us bond trader idiots that paid attention to that stuff. And nobody really cared about CPI or something, right? Because like inflation wasn't a big deal. It was like, is it one tenth off what was expected is kind of what drove the markets. Um, more than anything, I think what you learn is humility uh, and that things are often counterintuitive so as a bond trader, you take the firm's capital and say you had a strong feeling that uh, the economic releases were going to indicate that things were inflationary and you thought, OK, yields are going to go up as a result of this you know, data release. And so you got short $100 million worth of capital or something uh, going into the number, as they would say. And then you get the number right. You're all psyched, like, holy shit, I nailed it. This is great. And then the market reacts the inverse of what you thought. And it's just like, you just want to, so you learn humility. Uh, things are often counterly intuitive. Knee-jerk reactions are often not the kind of longer term market. And what you learn is kind of like Buffett says, you know, um, in the long term, uh, it really, the market is a weighing machine, not a voting machine. But in the short term, you know, things can things can be volatile and, and irrational. Were you thinking at the time just about how our whole system relies on credit and, and going further and further into debt? Not at all. I was 21 years old and I thought everybody on Wall Street seems to do well financially. I like money. I like stocks. I like bonds. I like investing. This is just the stuff that's interesting and appealing to me. And I was just looking for a way to kind of break in and learn and um Right or wrong, bonds were perceived as kind of the more intellectual side of things because um, they take into this whole into account, you know, the whole kind of macroeconomic uh, landscape, whereas stocks are more uh, story specific, you know, company specific, et cetera. Got it. Okay. Well, pivoting to the next step in your career where you shifted over to venture capital and started investing in the the internet startups. You know, what was that space like? I imagine that it's probably changed a lot, but it's interesting to think about Bitcoiners because a lot of them are sort of anti-VC, especially when it comes to the yeah. crypto space, right? So, so what, you know, what was your experience like? The parallel between the internet bubble bursting and where we are now in digital assets, the parallels are really extraordinary. It's like watching the same movie for a second time, um, which we can come back to. But but to answer your question directly, the kind of the excitement and hype around crypto um, was big and great over the last, you know, 24 months, call it, but it doesn't compare to kind of the hype and excitement around the internet 
1998, 99, 2000. So that just kind of swept up everybody. And it was the same thing. There's naysayers. This isn't going to work out. People aren't going to really sit there on their have these computers at home and do this stuff. Like, you know, so there's, there were all the naysayers, there's everybody who kind of got it. And so that was very similar for us. I was at a GE Capital, um, which at the time was the largest private equity investor in the world. Everybody now says they're in venture capital and private equity. To date myself a little bit at the time, there were only 4,500 people in the whole United States in private equity and venture capital. It was like a really small kind of cottage, not super cool industry to be in. Um, but investing in the internet was really cool. We were looking at um, companies that were using the internet in ways that made sense versus companies that were slapping a .com at the end of the name. Also very analogous to what's happening in crypto, right? So- okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. So you know, what was what was really cool is the internet was really good for some things. Um, for example, like, you know, one of the examples we used to use back then was if you had a book on how to fix a 1962 Corvette Stingray, like, and you went to go sell that at your garage sale on your street, it's worth nothing, right? The chance of somebody needing that book or having that car that needs that is like nothing. But if you had like a New York Times bestseller paperback, they would pay more for that maybe, right? Mm -hmm. But the reality was, if you could find the person that actually needed that book, that needed to know how to fix that car, that was worth a lot more than, you know, the Agatha Christie, like bestseller, right? So the internet was really good for locating that person, for that person being able to locate that book so that you could extract that kind of value. So internet was really good for sharing information at that time. It wasn't particularly safe or secure. Everybody was really fearful of putting credit card or bank information uh, into an email or into a website, which really hurt commerce. And so it was in the context of working um, in internet VC that I discovered Bitcoin. I went to a Bitcoin conference in 2013 in Miami, and it was the first time that I ever saw the internet being used to transmit value safely and securely. Um, and even better, you didn't have to have trusted intermediaries. And my mind was kind of blown. And I just thought, okay, I've got to do something in this space. What can I do? And this is like 2000. October, like 2013 or something, right? So oh, it was like, wow. there wasn't a lot you could do. I was like, well, I could like launch a website of a directory of companies that take Bitcoin, which mm -hmm. wasn't a good idea back then, probably wouldn't be a good idea today, right? So at the end of the day, I just said, well, I don't know like what I could do with this. So I just bought some because there was no other way that I could participate. I just thought, well, if this is going to work out, the price is going to go up because there's a fixed supply. So that's kind of, I bought my first Bitcoin in December, 2013. And that's kind of how I got involved. What was the price? Uh, it's on that sculpture back there. I think it was like eight hundred and $806. Eight hundred six dollars. Oh my yeah. gosh! I and I still don't have as many Bitcoin today as I did in December of two thousand thirteen. Unfortunately, ah, <laughs> uh, of course, yes. It's it's always interesting to hear those stories of you know you yeah. got in early at this really great price, you wrote it up, but then you sold, and you now you can't have, have as much as you did in the beginning. And I I've heard those so many times, and everybody thinks they're late. The people you know in this past year thought that they were late. Everyone's going to think they're late in 2025 when it's over a hundred thousand, right? <laughs> exactly. It's true. It's, you know, the challenge back then, not making excuses for myself, obviously in hindsight, I should have held it all. But the challenge back then was, it was like an emotional buy, you know, it was like, I want to be a part of this. There's there, this has the potential to be something really interesting and good, but we didn't have any of the traction we have today. There was none of the development. Yeah. There was no one no lightning network, no transactions, no infrastructure, no companies built around the space. It was, there was none of that. So it was, and the, and the volatility of the price was insane. It's like, you know, because it was really thinly traded as well. So it's like one day you're up a hundred percent, the next day you're down 75%. And I was just like, you know what? I, I Maybe I put too much in here. I don't know what I'm doing. And I sold it some you know, profit that doesn't matter now. Yeah. You know, I like, you know, I've been stacking pretty aggressively since 2016 and I'm still not back to where I was. 
Wow. Wow. Okay. Wait, I, I want to ask you a question though, about that comparison of the dot-com bubble to what we experienced yeah. in the last two years, because, you know, you obviously saw the euphoria of the height of that type of bubble when it was in the, in the nineties and then the crash that happened. I mean, some of these companies were never heard from again. Some of the websites, you know, like pets.com, right. um, some of them had, you know, their football stadium names and Super Bowl commercials. And then others, you know, really big, big names like Amazon, they got a haircut for like a decade. They went down 90%, even further than Bitcoin has has gone down in this bear market. Right. And it stayed there for a while and it was pretty painful. Uh, so when when we were sort of in the height of everything and Bitcoin was climbing, you know, almost hit 70,000, did you have that feeling maybe remembering from from your past kind of thinking maybe this is actually, you know, maybe this is a bubble that's going to burst and I, I should hold off at this level? Or did you think we were going all the way to, you know, 100, 150 and when, then when it crashes, it would maybe have a support level around 40, 50,000? Like what were your thoughts in the height of the last two years? Um, I mean, I was always certain that there would be a at least a 50% retracement, but whether that would happen at 60,000 or 260,000, yeah. you know, couldn't tell you, which makes it hard to, to trade and invest. But I think the bigger piece is, uh, you know, what you alluded to before, which is the internet bubble brought um, a lot of names, most of which were shit coins and most of which went away forever. Um, and then there was kind of this dormant period where only those using the internet for really valuable things emerged and then grew into the behemoths that we see today, the Googles, you know, the Amazons, the Facebooks, et cetera. So I think we will follow a similar path. I think that um, there probably are Bitcoin for sure. You know, Bitcoin's the, the one clear one that I think has a different value proposition, is on different footing, and probably shouldn't even be talked about in the same context as some of these other assets. Yeah. Um, I think Bitcoin is, um, my personal view is Bitcoin is a, a store of value, a lot like a digital gold. Um, it's a commodity, as two SEC chair people in a row have said. I think it's on better regulatory footing than anything else. And I think um, due to what, you know, I call it's immaculate conception, it would be hard to replicate something like that. Yeah. And so I think Bitcoin is going to not just survive, but it's going to thrive. Um, I think there's 99% of the other stuff is total shit coinery and scams and um, people uh, unethical people taking advantage of kind of the opacity and, and mm -hmm. you know, what it, what is a new technology. That said, there are a number of um, different types of functionality and other things that come out of digital assets that are real, that have value, that, you know, when done morally and ethically, likely in the form of a security, are going to create tremendous value. Will that happen on the Bitcoin blockchain? Will it happen on another blockchain? You know, I don't know. I'd love to see it happen on Bitcoin. It makes a lot of sense for it to happen on Bitcoin. You want that ethical, secure financial base layer. That said, there are times when, you know, perhaps some centralization and lack of security makes sense. And there are, you know, other things that are better, more centralized, as long as there's disclosure, consumer protections, and it's, you know, shared in the form of a security. We're going to take a quick break from the show to hear these messages from my sponsors. First up, I trust capital. Do you save in Bitcoin for your retirement in your IRA? I trust capital allows you to invest in Bitcoin and other digital assets with the tax benefits of an IRA. And unlike the stock market, you can buy and sell 24 hours a day. Instead of paying taxes on Bitcoin gains every year, you can defer taxes using an I trust crypto IRA. Or with an iTrust Capital Roth IRA, you can withdraw tax-free at retirement. iTrust recently hit a milestone of $6 billion in total transactions across the platform, and that's $6 billion in tax-advantaged accounts that those 87,000 new IRS agents can't do anything about. The iTrust Capital platform is easy to use and only takes a few minutes to set up. And if you want to start investing with a $100 bonus, head to itrust.capital slash Natalie Brunel. 
Next up, let's talk about Bitcoin 2023. That is the biggest Bitcoin conference in the world. And take a look at the video from last year in Miami. It was an incredible event that was jam packed with the best speaking sessions, workshops and networking events that I've been to in the space. I had the chance to live anchor the Bitcoin Magazine news desk and serve as MC. And it was such a full circle moment for me to be at that conference because the first one I attended was Bitcoin 2021 in Miami. And that's where I actually launched the Coin Stories podcast. I went on a media pass because I used to be a reporter and I actually went backstage and started asking the speakers like Michael Saylor and Preston Pish if they would come on my show. And they did. And a year later, I'm back at the conference as someone who actually has a career now in Bitcoin. So you never know what can happen at these events. I highly recommend going so you can meet other people that share the same values and passion for Bitcoin. And if you want your ticket at a 10% discount, head to b.tc slash conference and use the code HODL, H-O-D-L. I'll see you there. It sometimes feels so far away that we're going to have a... Um, like an ecosystem that's recognized as, hey, these are the securities and these are the commodities, or this is the one, yeah. you know, commodity pristine global reserve asset. And and then maybe the 20,000 will turn into, I don't know how many, but it's just, it just feels like even though regulation is probably going to come sooner rather than later, it just still feels like that world is so far away because the other blockchains and pro projects, they're so adamant that they're not securities and these exchanges have yeah. gotten away with for a long time trading them and selling them so they sort of have a vested interest as well right they do i mean also similar to the evolution of the internet we have a situation now where technology understandably has outpaced regulation yeah. so regulation is playing catch up here it doesn't mean that every project that's ever come out is bad if you wanted to start uh, some kind of blockchain based technology company or something, and you wanted to uh, launch that in a ethical kind of way, there is no framework for you to do that. Like there's no, mm -hmm. oh, this is how you do it. So they just did it like because they didn't want to wait because there's a technological opportunity. They sought out friendly domiciles in countries that were favorable or protected them. And a lot of them kind of did the best they could. A lot of them were total scumbags and, you know, stole people's money and they're awful people, right? So th there, there are both. And I, I don't think it's fair to lump everything all together. Just like I don't think it's fair to even think about Bitcoin in the same conversation. Bitcoin is infinitely more pure than any of this will ever be. And I think that the value proposition that Bitcoin offers is something that is appealing to not just investors, but nation states, I mean, 180 something currencies in the world, uh, 100 years from now, there are not going to be 180 currencies. Right. I would be surprised if there's 10. So what's going to happen to the other 170? They're going to go away. Those people and those countries and their economic situation is going to get destroyed. Like we've seen so many other countries. All it takes is some kind of first mover from one of those nation states to say, hey, I'm adopting some version of a Bitcoin standard, or like, even if you want to be really kind of evil, they could print a bunch of their own money while it still has value mm -hmm. and use their own increasingly worthless money to yeah. buy a ton of Bitcoin right. and like save themselves. So, and that can be done at a nation state level, that can be done at a company level, you know, kind of like MicroStrategy did, that can be done at a municipal level, it can be a city or a town or a state that issues bonds, you know, and uses yeah. the proceeds to buy Bitcoin. So I think like there's just tremendous opportunity for any massive player to step in and buy a good chunk of it. And there's just not that much to go around. It's really interesting just the the idea of currencies because I used to never think about currencies so much before I learned about Bitcoin. And yeah. it's almost frustrating that the other crypto projects are called currencies because the truth of the matter is when you study money, the, the qualities, the properties that make good money, Bitcoin checks all of the boxes and more. Uh, and yet these others, you know, I think that's what's so frustrating about the space is they're, they're not currencies. They're not going to hold up. You know, they might have their, their different, um, motivations in terms of what they want to create within the, in the, in the technology space, but they're not money. And all these other crypto or actual currencies in different countries, it's, 
sometimes no different than what the FTT token was. It's printing money using yeah. leverage. And it's just, you know, it's because someone says there's value, but inherently it's backed by nothing and it could all collapse uh, because the system's so fragile. And it's just, it's interesting to see just these two worlds sort of colliding and and the fact that so many people think, no, our money, it's always been the dollar, so it will always be the dollar. But but in so many other countries, they've seen an actual collapse. Their money has died. They've suffered from 80, 90% inflation, their savings wiped out overnight. And yet we sort of feel within our privilege here that that can't happen. But it is happening with some of these cryptocurrencies. It's definitely happening with some of these cryptocurrencies. I mean, the truth of the matter is, Bitcoin suffers from all these associations, right? And I think uh, I think we do ourselves a disservice by engaging in the debates between a Bitcoin and Ethereum or a Bitcoin and this other one. It's like they they don't even have a seat at the table. Like it's it's completely irrelevant in my opinion. Those are just technology companies that may or may not be offering great products and services, but they're not in the money game. Right. Nobody is trusting their money to this kid that puts out uh, the blueprint of the plan for the next 10 years, right? Like Vitalik that, and they've got every one of the projects that they're trying to do is a massive technological undertaking, which I don't know if, if you were investing in Google and they laid out the roadmap that Ethereum laid out, I think a lot of investors would say there's way too much execution risk. That's going to cost an yeah. ungodly amount of money. Like, right. I'm not investing in this, right? That's too right. risky. But for Bitcoin to put itself in the conversation next to Ethereum, right. I think is ridiculous. I think that the worst thing that we can do is engage in those comparisons, crap on the other cryptocurrencies. It puts us in the conversation with them and we get painted with the same brush. Yeah. We saw this with FTX, right? Like when FTX went down, this should have minted you know, tons of new Bitcoin maximalists who say, Fuck this. This is exactly what we're talking about. This is centralization. Uh, you know, FTX was a DeFi company, right? In my opinion, like it's a DeFi company that traded cryptocurrencies, but it's centralized. It's decentralized. You know, it's it's not, sorry, it's, it's a traditional finance company is what I'm saying. Yeah. It's a TradFi company, right? It's just they happen to just trade cryptocurrencies, yeah. but it's no different than any other shady bank that we've seen oh. throughout the years. And yet what happened was Bitcoin got destroyed, right, in a U.S. dollar price sense when FTX got crushed, partially because they sold a bunch of Bitcoin, but also because we we're, we're just get painted with the same brush because we don't do a great job of separating ourselves from that pack. We're going to take another quick break to hear these messages from my sponsors. First up, Fold. Fold is the best Bitcoin rewards debit card and shopping app in the world. You can earn Bitcoin on everything you purchase from Amazon to your groceries with Fold's Bitcoin cashback debit card and win free Satoshis every day or even a whole Bitcoin by spinning the daily wheel and the purchase rewards wheels. I actually have an alarm set every single day so that I never miss out on spinning the daily wheel and earning free sats. And, you know, I have to say that Fold is one of the best ways to get someone completely new into Bitcoin because they can start earning it and learning about it and using it. So if you want to sign up and join the fun, head to foldapp.com slash Natalie for 5,000 in free sats. All right. Now I want to tell you about a company called CrowdHealth, which is a Bitcoin enabled alternative to health insurance. Because let's be honest, the government and insurance companies have jacked up prices. They've made things super complex. And when you send your money in, it essentially goes into the health insurance black hole and then you never see it again, even if you don't get sick and you don't need medical services because, you know, you don't eat fiat foods. But then if you actually do get sick or you need care, you have to send them more money because something ends up not being covered. The great news is there's now an alternative brought to you by Bitcoiners, and it is called CrowdHealth. It is very different from insurance. Instead of sending your hard-earned money to an insurance company, you hold your money in an account that CrowdHealth helps you set up. And you can even convert the dollars in your account to Bitcoin. Now, the company is all about community. Remember, it's called crowd health. So when someone in the community is in need, needs care, needs help, you can choose to actually use the money in your account to help them, or you can keep it in your account. And if you ever leave crowd health, you can take the money that's left with you. If you want to learn more and sign up, you can head to joincrowdhealth.com slash Natalie. Now back to the show. We're just get painted with the same brush because we don't do a great job of 
separating ourselves from that pack. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting uh, point. And I want to ask you about starting your company because you have the Bitcoin investment group. So people can, you know, get, they can acquire Bitcoin through you, especially bigger institutions. Right. So can you talk about what it takes to have a company like that? Because what we saw with FTX is basically offshore and they didn't even have Bitcoin. They were essentially selling paper promises that didn't even exist. Um, So that, I mean, I think it was actually, I think it was actually considerably worse than that. What they did was if you had an account at FTX and you bought say 10 Bitcoin in your account, now you're, now you think you hold 10 Bitcoin, right? And they, in reality, you probably did buy 10 Bitcoin. They bought the bit, you bought the Bitcoin on the, through the FTX exchange. It's in your account. So there's 10 Bitcoin that's out of supply for the market. There's 10 Bitcoin that's being hodled. And then FTX said, well, we're just going to borrow the Bitcoin that's in your account. We'll return it to you later. We're going to lend it to our sister company, Alameda. They have plenty of capital. It's fine. We'll be able to buy your Bitcoin and give it back to you. And so they took 70 to 80,000 Bitcoin that should have been out of the supply, right? So less circulating supply. It's as if they... It's as if miners produce 25% more Bitcoin for the year. Like that's how much 80,000 is, right? And so not only was that supply not out of the market and people weren't hodling, they took the Bitcoin, sold 80,000 worth of Bitcoin, which drives the price down, number one, it creates a seller. And number two, it increases the float, the circulating supply. So it was like double vicious what they did. And then they proceeded to lose all the money and screwed everyone. So it's uh it's just like horrible. truly a perfect storm. Horrible. Yeah, it's it's horrible. I I I'm so anxious to see how this story develops given the fact that he's there's still no arrest and we're I don't know. Yeah. I'm a little disappointed in the in the mainstream news industry and uh, how they're they're not really asking the tough questions yet maybe that'll change but um well so talk Some about are. talk yeah. about doing it the right way cuz you obviously set up a company where people can acquire and hold their bitcoin so how does all that work and how did you decide you wanted to do that yeah so a couple things were important to me um in in setting it up the first is and i know uh that a lot of people say not your keys not your coins and, and i certainly respect that narrative but there are a great number of people for whom um, holding their own keys is not appealing to them, right? Um, if you are a 70 uh, year old matriarch or patriarch of a very wealthy family, you are not interested for the most part in, you know, learning about multi-sig, storing this. It's just not what you want to do. You say, okay, maybe someday down the road, but right now, I think that Bitcoin Bitcoin has a value proposition. I would like to participate in it. How do I do it, right? So by definition at that point, you need a, a trusted custodian. And so what I did is I worked with Fidelity Digital Assets, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of Fidelity. And I think, uh, you know, by far the most well-respected custodian, you know, in the world. In addition to that, Abigail Johnson, who's not just the CEO of Fidelity. She is also the owner and the heir of Fidelity. The reason that they're in the business is because she's passionate about Bitcoin in particular. So they have built tremendous safety around their custody and cold storage. So I worked with them, partnered with them. And so all of our Bitcoin in our in Bitcoin investment group is stored with them, which including all of my own Bitcoin. Um, except a little bit on like non-custodial wallets that I use for like introducing people to Bitcoin and stuff. Um, but all my investment Bitcoin is is at Fidelity Digital Assets as well. And the really cool, we did a couple of really cool things with the fund. One is um, we only charge 1% a year, no other fees or expenses. Um, I eat all the fees and expenses out of that 1%, which means it's not a particularly good business for making money. But the other two things that we did were, one is we maintain separately managed accounting for each individual account, which is super expensive, but it's necessary so that other people's capital movements don't impact uh, you you as an investor. If someone sells their Bitcoin, you're not impacted. And then the other thing that we did, which is really unique, is when someone leaves the fund, um, if they decide that they want US dollars, we'll sell the requisite amount of Bitcoin and send them US dollars. But 
were unique in the sense that if they want Bitcoin, if they say, hey, I'm comfortable, you know, you know, custody my own Bitcoin now, um, can you send me, you know, the requisite amount of Bitcoin for my position? Sure. You know, we verify the wallet and we send them their Bitcoin. So that's really unique. Is And that was the most important thing to me was that ultimately the best thing about Bitcoin is that it is a bearer asset. And I didn't yeah. want to do a fund where you couldn't ultimately be the bearer of that asset. Well, I know that you focus a lot on people who maybe have a, a little bit more wealth or are involved in the institutional space. So what are you seeing? Like, is the adoption growing there? Because it felt for a while like it is and like we're headed yeah. in the right direction. We had, you know, Michael Saylor, big publicly traded company, which I'll ask you about as well, because I know you orange pilled him. But I mean, are we still moving in that direction, given everything, the volatility in this bear market? Overall, yes. You know, I think when you have something like Bitcoin, it's unlike uh, a real estate investment or a stock um, or other investment assets in that there aren't traditional valuation metrics. We can't do a discounted cash flow analysis. We can't do a multiple of sales or something, right? That doesn't exist. So as a result, Bitcoin tends to trade on more of like a technical retail kind of basis. It's more emotional momentum driven. Yeah. And as the price moves in certain directions, people emotions move in those directions too, right? So people are amazingly have more conviction buying at 50,000 than they do at 16,000, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that said, the savvy institutions are not subject to the same kind of thinking, which is why you're seeing uh, Bank of New York, Mellon, right? Um, Merrill Lynch, JP Morgan, even. Um, you're seeing these banks, Blackstone, BlackRock, you're seeing these banks continue to take steps, you know, like this is coming, this is going to be a big thing, fundamentally setting things up, filing for patents on wallets, et cetera. They're putting all the infrastructure in place while retail gets scared and sells. Mm, that's interesting. It's a um, little bit infuriating to me because I felt like Bitcoin was something that the people kind of embraced first mm -hmm. and, and the banks and the institutions were behind. And now that we've had like a couple shocks to the system, the, the retail investor is getting scared, unfortunately, and they're selling. And the banks are kind of like, they're going to end up owning a big chunk of this anyway. They're going to get themselves a seat at the table, which is a little bit upsetting to me. It would have been nice for the plebs to win this. So I hope people huddle for that reason, um, which is why I always say that the key thing in, in being able to hold on to your Bitcoin is education. If, right. if you're subject to the emotions that go with it, your chance of being able to hold through like the bad times is very, very low. You have to have really done your research and have conviction for the right moral, ethical and financial reasons. Right. Well, given that there isn't this sort of clear path within this space to register a company and all that, did you encounter that as well? I mean, as far as regulation and registration of a company that is essentially uh, helping people get on board with Bitcoin and hold it, I, how did that work with with BIG? Yeah. It was very it was very difficult. Um, Signature Bank of New York, which is an eighty billion dollar um, you know traditional bank in the United States we were their first crypto related account. So uh, now it's about 20 plus percent of all their AUM. So, you know, that was challenging finding a fund administrator, somebody to like kind of do the books for the account was very challenging, made even more challenging by doing the accounting in Bitcoin. They were not interested in doing that at all. So if you have an account with Bitcoin investment group, your monthly statement will be shown in Bitcoin. So if you've got like 50 Bitcoin, uh, when you get your monthly statement, it says 50 Bitcoin. There's no US dollar, anything on it. It's Perfect. Cool. So that, but that was, that's very challenging when you're doing something when a traditional fund where people are getting a K1 at the end of the year and those kinds of things that give them comfort and that kind of thing. Yeah. It's uh, it was challenging to get service provide, com really competent, well-respected service providers and banks to, uh, you know, to do it that way. It's challenging. <laughs>
What was your response when all of this FTX stuff came out, especially knowing, you know, sort of the loopholes that that FTX yeah. and SBF were able to go through when we have people who I admire so much in the space, like Caitlin Long, who's had an application with the Fed, right, for custodia for like two years. Yeah. And meanwhile, the San Francisco Fed is, you know, approving this random tiny bank out of like Washington that somehow is affiliated now with FTX. I know that the developments are still, you know, we're, we're still learning what's happening with that, but it's like, why, why are there some, some winners that, that the government's choosing over other people that are actually trying to help this space in, in a way that has integrity? Yeah. My, my reaction to FTX, um, was a combination of sadness and anger, you know, it's just, uh, it's so incredibly evil, right? That that this person um, painted themselves in the light of being the the white knight, the good guy of the industry, um, and was engaged in uh, incredibly immoral and unethical behavior. And it really, I think, it's particularly negative because all the money that he splashed around politically. Um, mostly on the Democrat side, but also very materially on the Republican side as well. And then that little, um, if we're to believe the screenshots from uh, his little text exchange, his DM exchange with the reporter and him acknowledging that all the ESG stuff and all the political donations were just to kind of give cover and be perceived as good um, as he you know, went and did the nefarious shit that he did. Uh, it just set back the whole industry, um, you know, for some period of time, a year, two years, whatever it is. And that's really sad. And by set back the industry, I mean, we do still get painted with a singular brush, even though not all the assets are the same as we know. Um, but as you try to um, move Bitcoin into the traditional finance world, this hurt the trust. FTX had moved into the traditional finance world. They had relationships with traditional banks. They had relationships with politicians. They had relationships with regulators. And so all of those groups that they had these relationships with are, you know, will naturally pull back as a result of getting a black eye here from this asshole. Yeah. So I think that's that's the part that's infuriating and sad. And in addition to the financial damage that he caused. Yeah. No, I, I really hope that justice is served, although it's what's happening. I don't right even now, know what's, what's justice. How does, yeah. how does justice get served? I mean, he should be in people, jail. That's the start. Well, yeah. But the, the people, the people who did this being punished doesn't, doesn't do anything to fix the damage that they've caused. Yeah. It doesn't reimburse the people. It doesn't re reimburse those 80,000 Bitcoins that people thought they held it, it doesn't fix the damage that's been done with trust in, in right. like you know, the entire global community. So yeah, I'm sure they'll get what they deserve, um, but it's just not enough. Yeah, no, and I, I agree with you. I think it sets it sets us back a little bit because people don't trust the space. And it is inspiring to see that a lot of people are pulling their Bitcoin off and hodling and a lot of Bitcoin, at least over the last year, has actually yeah. not moved. So that that gives me some hope that people are now seeing how important it is to understand where you actually hold your Bitcoin, not just where you buy it. Um, but I wanted to ask you, you know, you everyone knows that you orange pilled Michael Saylor. First of all, how did you guys meet? And when you were kind of going through your process of helping him learn, you mm -hmm. know, what do you think? is the reason that you were able to convince someone who has so much experience within the fiat world has, has obviously capitalized on it. He's one of the wealthiest people on the planet. How do you think you were able to convince him that Bitcoin was something to take as seriously as he did? And he remains the, you know, I think one of the only publicly traded company leaders that, that has gone into the space. Yeah. So we met, um, more than 20 years ago, 20, 25 years ago, uh, skiing. Um, yeah. yeah, back when we both skied, neither one of us ski anymore, I don't think. Um, my sister was friendly with um, Michael and some of his friends, and we met and uh, wow. you know, kind of got along, hit it off a little bit. And 
stayed friends uh, pretty much ever since. And I had been talking about Bitcoin, you know, for many, many years. Right. And he was not orange pilled, right? So he was, he was actually, not only was he not orange pilled, he was against it before he was for it. And at what the would time, he say to you? What would he say to you when you brought it up at that time? Oh, suffice to say, it was dismissed sometimes more politely than others. <laughs> <laughs> um, Michael Michael doesn't often talk about things that he doesn't want to talk about, um, as you know. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, there were times when I brought it up when, uh, you know, I got a little bit of a lecture about why it was very gutsy to uh, leave my traditional finance career mm -hmm. to come to something that was unproven that had a questionable reputation. And uh, he was looking out for me as a friend, you know, trying to protect me. And then fast forward a few years, uh, the world had changed, right? And he was running, uh, you know, a big publicly traded software company. And there was inflation was existing. It was there, but it wasn't Rob. He could still make a profit and keep that profit. Right. It wasn't yeah. all being eroded away. So he just didn't really have a need to learn about store of value or a cool technology at a time when he's like, I got my own cool technology to work on, dude. And I'm competing with fucking Microsoft and Salesforce. Like I don't have time for this shit, you know, like, I'll go, I'll go be the billionaire. You go play with your little stuff. Right. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, not that attitude, but really it's like, it just didn't touch his life. Yeah. And then, you know, during the pandemic, um, we were spending a lot of time together because nobody could really lockdowns, do anything. Yeah. Lockdowns. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, as you know, the accommodations at his place are, you know, better than my apartment. So we would hang out at, at his house a lot and, and kind of, you know, sit by the pool and, have our coffee and talk and and try to figure out what was going on in the world as they're locking everything down and printing money like crazy. And we thought the stock market should be getting crushed and they weren't, they were going up and we're like, this is surreal. What the fuck is going on here? And uh, Michael remembers saying me saying something like uh, every time there's like a big paradigm shift like this, there's opportunity. We just have to find the opportunity. And then I started talking about Bitcoin and instead of kind of moving me on to the next topic, you know, this one time, he just looked at me like very seriously and interested. And I said a couple sentences because I don't want to say too much. And he said, tell me more about that. And I was just like, whoa, this is different. You know, unbe unbeknown to me in the background, he was stressing about the 500 million in cash that MicroStrategy had. Yeah. And the fact that you know, by his calculation, they were losing about 10% of their purchasing power a year. So losing about 50 million a year. And his company, he's got 2000 people working, hoping to make 50 million a year, right, for the company. And so in the best case scenario, he's on a treadmill. And so this was kind of in the back of his mind when he said, you know, tell me more about that. So we spent, um, you know, I guess the better part of a week uh, talking about it. And I shared everything that I knew, which when you talk to Michael about something at length, he realizes not as much as you wish you knew, right? Like yeah. he, he, ran, he ran through my knowledge pretty quickly. And then, um, and then he was yeah. like, well, where can I find out more about this? And I kind of pointed him to some resources and then, uh, and then it was, well, okay, if I wanted to buy some of this, how would I buy it? And so uh, I helped him with that piece as well. And, you know, then one day I'm, pulling into a restaurant down here in Miami and uh, the phone rings as I'm like in my car pulling in and it's Michael and usually he texts, not call. So I was like, Oh shit, something, you know, so I, I answer the phone. I'm like, what's up? And he's like, well, uh, I bought Bitcoin and I go, cool. And he goes, yeah, 10,000. And at the time Bitcoin was 10,000 bucks, right? Bitcoin. And I, I was like, you bought one Bitcoin. And he goes, no, Eric, I bought 10,000 Bitcoin. So <laughs> his first trade was like a hundred million dollar personal investment. And I went from thinking. Wait, oh, that was his personal? Yeah, that's personal. Oh, my God. Yeah. So he, you know, I went from thinking I got to get my buddy involved in Bitcoin to, oh, shit. 
my buddy just bought a hundred million dollars worth of Bitcoin. So uh, yeah, that was, <laughs> that's kind of the story. This better work, Eric, or you're in serious trouble. You're not going to be able to hang out at that pool anymore. <laughs> I mean, he's still up 62% on yeah. that initial hundred million. That's well, not nothing. I, I love the story because I do think it's actually a, a greater metaphor for what happens in all of our lives. Those of us who are already orange pilled, but sprinkling and planting those little seeds with people because it does take a while. I was there too. I dismissed it. I doubted it. I thought it was like a, a stock or something that could easily get hacked because it's digital. And no. I just, the little seeds that you planted along the way with Michael, right? Like, where you probably compared it to different things and and you talked about mining, those stuck somewhere. And and then all yeah. of a sudden there was this, this new value proposition with what was happening on a macro level with money printing and the response to COVID. I mean, because really, if we didn't have the pandemic, I feel like there are a lot of people who wouldn't be Bitcoiners right now, including perhaps Michael, because there, w- there wasn't that like massive spotlight shining on the fact that our money is dying. Well, it was also the pandemic that killed the money. Like it was dying really slowly before yes. that. When you go from 13 trillion to 24 trillion in M2 in 24 month period, that's what kills it, right? But I think like the other thing that, uh, you know, the, the, the advice that I would give those looking to orange pill people is first of all, no one legitimately gets orange pilled by someone else. In order for someone to be orange pilled, you've got to do your own work. You, you're going, the individual is going to have to come to their own conclusions and they're going to have to do their own research before they have any conviction. You're not going to sell someone on it. So the best you can do to orange pill someone is pique their interests, provide answers, provide resources, stay credible, stay rational, in most cases, stay polite. And you know, when they're ready they can be orange build. It's a little bit like getting someone substance abuse help. Like you're not going to help them until they're ready, you know? So when someone's ready to learn about Bitcoin, be that resource for them and, uh, you know, be humble, be respectful. It's not intuitive. Almost nobody comes to it initially and is like, oh yeah, this makes total sense. I'm in. Yeah. No, exactly. And I find the pain points that bring people into the space so diverse and fascinating, especially when you talk to people from other uh, countries. I wanted to ask you about what legitimate threats do you see to Bitcoin? Because something that I think about a lot, and I've talked to some other folks in the space where we try to poke holes in this. Like if if you know if yeah. you're if you're intellectually curious and you have humility, you need to poke holes in this because this is you know for some of us we're putting a huge chunk of our life savings into it, so we need to plug any hole that might exist, right? So what what do you see as genuine threats? Um, because when I think about it. I just wonder how are we going to transition to a form of money that whether we like it or not does endanger the monopoly that states have on money and does endanger the sort of the the power that comes with with money being so closely tied to the state and we don't want to appear threatening right even though inherently it is it's this grassroots technology that's taking hold that is about the best engineered money that's ever existed. But how can the two coexist? Is that potentially a threat, this idea that the powers that be will try to stop Bitcoin in some way? Yeah, it's an interesting question. So there's a couple of different ways to think about it. I don't think anything threatens Bitcoin in the sense that it's going to be eliminated. So there's no, there is no way to eliminate it. So I don't worry about it in that sense. Um, I do think about kind of what enables or hurts us along the path to becoming too big to fail, so to speak. Yeah. And I, my personal view is the best way to accomplish that is to just be a digital gold, right? And gold is not threatening to anyone or anything, right? Uh, It's been around forever. It exists as a commodity, just like we do. We compare very favorably to gold in every single possible way, with the exception of 5,000 years of history. It's the only thing that kind of gold has on us, right? And we have a number of technological advantages over gold. So 
even if Bitcoin were to rival gold, that implies a U.S. dollar value of five hundred thousand uh, dollars, you know, per BTC. And I think at that point, then we are too big to fail, and Bitcoin may very possibly start to eat a lot of other stuff at that at that stage. But you know, there's some risks in getting there. Um, we are vulnerable. There are certainly regulatory things that could hurt us, and, and um, you know, it depends kind of. It depends which, which nation states line up as your allies and which nation states line up as your adversaries also helps for, shape the narrative. So, um, yeah, I, I think the most constructive way is just the digital gold comparison. It, it translates well to people who are not in the space and uh, it gets us, I think, where we need to be. Well, so let's go with that. Let's say it reaches the $10 trillion market cap, $500,000 of Bitcoin, which sounds yep. you know great, especially for people that were in it early. What do you say to the folks that are you know on the sidelines right now and they go, okay, what? So my upside is like a couple times. I mean, I might as well just stick to my stocks and, and my traditional investments. Why what, why would I take a, the risk for, for an upside where I can't even buy a house in most cities for 500000 Yeah. I mean- you know this quite well. Sometimes upside's not the motivating factor. Sometimes it's avoiding the downside, right? So inflation is the downside. And, you know, gold may not have great returns, but there are still a number of very sophisticated investors in nation states that will allocate a percentage of a portfolio to gold. They don't look and say, what's the price per ounce? They say, okay, put 5% in gold, right? And I think Bitcoin will be treated the same way. They're not going to say, what's the price per Bitcoin? They're going to say, okay, do a 5% allocation to Bitcoin. And I think you know that that's where you want to be. And as people start to see that gold works, I mean, sorry, Bitcoin works where gold doesn't work, mm-hmm. you know, then, then you'll see the allocations increase. Like gold, gold doesn't work. Right. It doesn't work anymore. At one point, gold held, you know, 90 plus percent of the world's wealth. Now it's like sub two percent. And the price is the same price it was a dozen years ago in face of the most inflationary environment we've ever seen. So it's clear that gold's not working and we need an alternative. And I don't know of an alternative other than Bitcoin. Right, right. I mean, it's interesting because I I almost wonder, is it a zero-sum game? I mean, with your experience in bonds before, do you think that go, uh, Bitcoin could legitimately eat into bonds, which is, I think, still the largest Absolutely. asset class, right? Without a doubt. Without a doubt. I, I think that if you really want to get scared of when nation states start to push back, it's it's when it does eat into bonds. It's when, it's when the, you know... It's when nation states can no longer issue bonds, right? Their lifeblood, because people are buying Bitcoin instead of buying the bonds. And that's when I think you could see really significant nation state pushback. Well, I think about this stuff, Eric, you know, because... It, let's say yeah. it does get to that that market cap. It's not going to just stop there. And if people, if more and more people on board, if it does go into the the reserves of countries as as reserve currency, if you know Russia the other day just said that they're looking for digital currencies as payment for oil, it's like I feel like it's either a Bitcoin world or not a Bitcoin world. It's one or the other. I don't see how they can, t- you know, let's fast forward this 20, 50 years. How it's just going to be, oh, well, there's this Bitcoin thing. It's like gold and you have a little bit of your savings in it, but we still have everything else. That doesn't make any sense to me, to be honest. I understand. I understand your perspective. I think it it, it does make sense to me, right? Um, there, there are some benefits to being diversified. There are different use cases for different uh-huh. things. There are still, uh, you know, by that rationale, it's like, well, why would anyone hold you know, sovereign debt other than U.S. sovereign debt, right? Like, is anybody, essentially, it's a play on currency, right? Mm -hmm. Do you really want to hold any, but yet there's many, many trillions of dollars of it, right? So there, there's no shortage of investors with different perspectives, different use cases who will continue to hold lots of different assets. Yeah. Um, But, you know, hopefully Bitcoin, you know, we've, we've broken into the narrative, right? Like if you turn on CNBC, and, and you're, you know, find me another 
thing Bitcoin size that no. has a little bug in the bottom right where they're showing you the price 24 seven. Totally. So it's like captured mind share. It's like, there are plenty of stocks bigger than Bitcoin. They're not showing their the price of those stocks rotating continuously. They're not showing the bond yields of countries that have more sovereign debt than the value of Bitcoin rotating. So people are starting to get it, I think. It's, it's starting to uh, infect the minds in a positive way of thoughtful people. Okay. So I want to get your response to something because one of my favorite people in the space is Jeff Booth. I just did a couple of um, conferences where I interviewed him on stage and he talks about real estate because real estate is a massive chunk of the world's you know, money and assets. And he talked about how Bitcoin is re slowly repricing everything. And he poses this question that I think- Very is so slowly. Important. Right. But but <laughs> I, he poses this question that I think is so important and, and is so, you know, it's so central to his book that I love, The Price of Tomorrow. It's like, why is the price of your house going up every single year to the extent that it is? Why do we see such asset inflation when the actual utility value is not increasing? It's not like these houses are actually worth that much. It's just there's more money, right? Abundance and money. So, and there's and there's fewer houses than, uh, than the money supply. Right. So- so he he talks about a world where houses fall to their utility value and price, but no one would vote. He also talks about how no one would vote for a system where your house is going down in value, right? But that's essentially what hard money, what Bitcoin promises. So do you see a world where, you know, your house isn't, real estate is not this kind of investment class that it is today, where people use it as such a store of value. The majority of Americans probably have most of their wealth in their home, that the equity is in their home, as opposed to in a store of value like Bitcoin. No, you don't. So you think houses will still go up, up, up? Houses not only have utility; they generate. They they can be revenue generating. Um, just like Bitcoin is a scarce asset, property is a scarce asset. Scarce assets tend to inflate uh, with inflation. Um, scarce assets with utility also inflate with inflation to some degree better. Sometimes there's, you know, cash flow metrics that you can also associate with them. I think that, um, I think real estate will continue to do well and be a thing. It's been a thing since, I guess, the beginning of time. It'll probably continue to be a thing. Um, can you ever, can you imagine a time when the awesome Citadel on the hill in the great position in the great location isn't going to have tremendous value. I don't think so. So it's it's interesting. I mean, I I do in a way love the thought because I think that real estate is run away, especially from younger people feeling like they can never catch up. They they always have to be renters because they can't afford a house. And it would be nice, you know, if I could buy a house like Michael's, you know, for like three hundred k, that'd be like a really cool cool world. That's okay, but you, but you're but you're proving my point, not the Jeff Booth point, right? If you had if you had you know. $50 billion worth of Bitcoin, okay, you might want Michael's house. It's a beautiful So, house. And there may be more than one person with $50 billion worth of Bitcoin, yeah. and they can have an open market where yeah. those people can decide what that house is worth. <laughs> it's it's going to have value. It's a nice house. Yeah, for sure. No, it's, it's really interesting to think about the different the different asset classes that we have and what Bitcoin will eventually. Right. But, but, the, but just to like draw that out a little more, the utility of that house is not entirely different than the utility of your house or my house, right? It provides shelter, it provides warmth, there's air conditioning, there's heat. So utility wise, does Michael's house provide that much more utility than ours? Probably not, but the price difference is always going to be dramatically different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely interesting to think about. He's had me thinking about real estate and what what Bitcoin could do to these different yeah. asset classes. But all right, so to start to wrap up, what's, you know, as far as this bear market, running a company within the space can't be sure. easy, especially during a time like this. And knowing what you went through with the 90s bubble and into the 2000s where that kind of lasted a while until yeah. a new bubble took over and then quantitative easing was like the you know the the mo what, what, how are you looking at this this period right now i'm looking at it a couple of different ways um for one thing yes there is cyclicality um and you know past may not be prologue but it is relevant and bitcoin in particular is particularly cyclical some people think that it coincides with the halving cycle some people think that that's causality others may think it's just you know coincidence or correlation as opposed to causation um i don't know um 
But I think so from an investment point of view, I think that the world has decided there's real functionality and real value and real utility here. And adoption is going to continue to increase. And we see lots of fundamental metrics, you know, pointing to that. But, you know, for me personally, it's not just the investment side of things. It's also kind of, you know, morally and ethically, I think you have to stand for something in life, at least I do. Um, you know, I'm at the point now where I want to work on things that I feel good about that matter to me. And I, I have zero interest in being a martyr. I don't want to die on this hill, but um, but it's worth fighting for. And I like being comfortable, um, you know, on the footing that we're on, fighting for the individual, fighting for people not having their life savings stolen for them, fighting to have, you know, hard money where people can save the product of their life's work and their labor. Yeah. Uh, th those are things worth fighting for. And, you know, if someday someone showed me a better alternative to Bitcoin for those things, I'm open to looking at it, right? I'm not saying like, no, it's going to be Bitcoin, um, even though I think that right now because I haven't seen anything close. So um, I'm staying the course for that reason. It means something to me. And I really do think that ultimately we're going to win. Um, but if not, it's a fight worth fighting. I want to ask you something personal, Eric, um, because what you're talking about is the greater purpose. And I do think that there's something that draws a lot of us into this space where it's so much bigger than us. And I know I've talked a little bit to Michael about this in some of my interviews, but just this idea that this could actually, through technology, make the world a more fair, a more accessible, a better place for a lot of people by mm -hmm. fixing and addressing the problems with our money. Um, what, what does legacy mean to you? Because for a lot of people, it's even, you know, simpler than, than anything to do with career. It's like, well, my legacy is my family, my children. I know that's not the case with you, at least at this point in your life, but this is like a greater mission at hand for both you and Michael. So like, what does legacy mean to you? Not much. Um, I think legacy is kind of ego driven and a lot and, and a little bit foolish, um, I think it was Marcus Aurelius that said, um, soon you will have forgotten all and all will have forgotten you, right? So whatever time period you think is relevant, like probably isn't relevant. Might someone remember someone from our generation uh, a couple thousand years from now? Sure, 5,000, maybe 10,000, almost definitely not. 100,000 for sure not. So, you know, what? It, what is legacy? Um, that said, I do think that if you look at what has survived for the last 2000 years, right, what has survived is religion, right, is Catholicism, Judaism, Islam, gold to a degree, these, these things have survived, and they've survived for I think the same reason that Bitcoin has a chance of surviving. The Bitcoin maximalist, the passion, the indoctrination, the the you know, the belief system associated with it, I think is that combined with the technology that can't be killed or destroyed, gives Bitcoin like a real chance at longevity. That's interesting. I, I love that both you and a lot of the other prominent voice in the space voices have talked a lot about ethics. Like ethics to me, I, I don't know what it is about my background, but I'm driven by something that is ethical and yeah. I need to maybe explore why Bitcoin is ethical and why I feel that it truly is. But why are ethics so important to you? Because you've brought them up. You've brought ethics up a couple of times in this conversation. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's important for me to feel good about what I'm doing every day. I think, you know, as you, as you have a career in finance and wall street uh, and you meet a lot of interesting, successful people, you start to analyze individuals, you read biographies of people and you see that there are an awful lot of ways to be successful. Right. And some people go about it in great ways and others go about it in, um, you know, unethical, unscrupulous kind of ways. And for me personally, 
Um, I'm not going to enjoy the products of my effort if I feel like I've stolen from someone or made the world the worst place to get there. That's not going, I'm, I'm going to feel guilty. Maybe it's the way I was brought up and kind of what was instilled in me, but I'm not going to feel good about that. And I want to continue to sleep well at night, which I do. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I don't need to like make the world a better place. I don't have some grand, you know, goal or vision like that. I just want to feel good about my little contribution for the time that I'm here and, uh, you know, maybe leave things a little better than I found them and enjoy my life while I'm here. I love that. What a perfect place to end. I've been so lucky to know people like you, Eric, and I really appreciate how welcoming you've been. And the contribution that you've made, not only by being a Bitcoiner yourself, by bringing, but bringing in someone like Michael. So any final thoughts, any, any last things that you want to share with, with anyone listening to this? No, I would just say kind of similar to what you said. I think that, uh, you know, meeting you and becoming friends over the last couple of years has been terrific. You're, I think everybody knows you, you wear your heart on your sleeve and that you're just like a genuinely great person. And I think that that's one of the cool things about Bitcoin, right? Is it does really attract some of the best quality people that I've met in my life. And it's really unique in the sense we're all kind of working towards this for the right reasons, not because the company is paying us, you know, or for advancement. So I think it attracts like really great people who, whether you're looking at the memes or the research or all the stuff that everybody's doing to kind of help this, nobody's paying them to do it. Uh, for the most part. So I just think it attracts really good people. And uh, that's part of enjoying life is surrounding yourself with, you know, like minded people that you like. So it's, it's a nice industry to work in as well. I agree. I am always learning from all of you. And guys, I mean, really think about it when this works, not if but when this works, look at the people we're going to be surrounded by. I mean, this is like so exciting. <laughs> like, <laughs> I can't believe it. Um, we'll but no, there. it's 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 awesome. Thanks so much, Eric. This has been fun. Thanks so much for having me. You're the best, Matt. Thank you so much for checking out this show. Again, make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out on any new content. And I love to hear your feedback. Leave a comment or send me an email at natalie at talkingbitcoin.com. Let me know what you think, if you have guest suggestions, and I'll see you next time.